You know, David, one of the things, when I think about the axioms of objectivism, and I talk to people about objectivism right. or I read what they say about it, and they often say, oh, well, Ayn Rand said there are these axioms, so the whole philosophy has to be deduced like it was Euclid's geometry. And I think that's just strange in a way and makes me wonder in, uh, partly why Rand chose the word axiom. Well, I think she chose the word axiom because it has, uh, uh, it has a history in philosophy of meaning basic principles. So, uh, uh, for example, I believe that in, in Aristotle, when he talks about the law of non-contradiction, which is part of, uh, which is axiomatic, uh, axiom is one of the words that is used in English to translate the Greek. Uh, and that tradition is somewhat different from what it is in mathematics. Although, as you know, um, in modern philosophy, the rationalists like Descartes and Spinoza took the model of Euc Euclidean uh, geometry. Um, to try to create philosophical systems. But, um, but yes, that's a common misunder mis misunderstanding of Rand. I mean, Milton Friedman once said that, and I mean, you can't get more in intelligent and yeah, <laughs> well-read than, than him. Uh, but y absolutely, the, the axioms like uh, existence, identity, causality, are not... Uh, are not basic principles from which you can deduce things. In fact, you really can't deduce any, much of anything from them. Uh, what they are really is, is guidelines. They give you the, what, it, what's, what, what is the fundamental fact about reality in relationship to your mind and the fundamental guidelines for, for thinking. Yeah, you all. know, I'd, I'd bring up, too, for people that are the least bit confused about that, we have a lovely thing called the Logical Structure of Objectivism on our <laughs> website. You just look for that on our website, and there we have a diagram of what we think the essential arguments of objectivism are and their relations to each other. And yes, exactly, indeed, yeah. it begins with the axioms, but we're not deducing the system from the axioms. Information is coming in at all stages, new information. Uh, adding in to the whole system. And the axioms are really just this methodological starting point or a reminder that we need to take account of the fact that reality's there and that mm -hmm. we've got to deal with it. Right. No, that's <laughs> true. And, um, I mean, all, all of knowledge comes from, uh, ultimately from the observation of, of the world by our senses, our five senses. And yeah, and that includes, even the axioms, as I tried to explain, they are based on observation of the world. It's just that they're contained in every observation. And that's why, in a sense, they're not, they don't tell us anything specific about the world, right? All right, because they're not a claim about this thing or that thing, and they don't say, this thing is this way. Exactly, yeah. They just say, whatever is, is, whatever acts, acts, it acts as it is and must. Sounds so simple. Yes, they are simple. <laughs> self-evident. They are self-evident, <laughs> yes. Um, that's another term that I think um, people sometimes we need to clarify uh, people, for the sake of people because lots of things have been called self-evident. And sometimes people say, you know, well, self-evident, that just means it's obvious. Um, or you, you fool, can't you see it? But in, in, again, in philosophy, it has a very strict meaning. It, it means the, you can perceive that in fact in the world that makes the statement true. You don't have to infer it in any way. And that's a, one of the characteristics of, of an axiom. And it's not true of very much, of very many things. So, um, you know, and another thing that I find sometimes it needs clarifying is that within, a, within some field of knowledge, people talk about the axioms, meaning just the basic principles, like the basic principles of engineering or of physics or medicine or whatever. And, you know, I got, each field has a delimited scope that it deals with, and it does have some the fundamental principles that define or lie at the basis of the whole field of knowledge. But, again, those are not literally axioms in the sense we mean philosophically. Um, 
So uh, it's a it's a term that has been used in different ways, and it could lead to confusion on people's part. I, I appreciate that, but I don't I don't know a better one. What, no, I think Ayn Rand picked term? it, I suppose, just to say we start here, and right. this is the thing you must never forget. Exactly, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. So. Um, the question is, they're so, they are self-evident, and they're so simple, and yet whole philosophies have been constructed that deny, for example, what, uh, the primacy of, con of existence. The idea that uh, consciousness, which is one of the axioms, and one of the axiom ax axiomatic features of it is that consciousness is fundamentally awareness of the world. It's relational. It's outward directed. Even in introspection, when we look inward, the I that's doing the looking is, is aware of something in, in our minds, a thought or emotion that it's now observing internally. So, but people have constructed um, these, these ideas that consciousness creates the world. And it's a little bit like, I think, in those cases, um, philosophers noticed that all their ideas are their ideas. Everything they see, they see. Right. And they focus on then on what's called the phenomenology, the experience of seeing, the experience right. of thinking. And then they think, well, there's nothing but that phenomenology. There's nothing but the experience of being conscious. I think that seems to be where these folks are coming from. Of course, as Ayn Rand yeah. said, a consciousness, you know, a consciousness of nothing would be a contradiction in terms. Right, right. But it, the, the, the inner experience, the, the, the world as experienced by us, um, I think maybe gives rise to some skeptical doubts, at least has for some philosophers, because uh, we sometimes find out that, that the way the world seems to us turns out not to be the way the world is. And from that, you take these little steps down a slippery slope toward what if it's all wrong? What if it's all, what if we're making up the whole thing? Yeah, no, but that's a sort of, I think there's a fundamental error there. I bet you'll agree when I say this, because when people... Uh, the, very, the very idea of error, when they say there's an error, they're assuming that there's a contrast object to error which is being correct. <laughs> right. If they're assuming they don't have knowledge in one area, they're contrasting it with the experience of having knowledge somewhere else. And so you can be skeptical about an area of your knowledge, mm -hmm. skeptical about a set of ideas you have, but to be completely skeptical, well, then what does that even mean? Because yeah. you, you, you've eliminated the contrast object that made being skeptical meaningful. Exactly, exactly. And on top of that, how do they know we ever make an error in the first place? And if they, they knew that, that <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, that's the, that's the contradiction of skepticism. All right. So, um, but you know, there are, there are other, I think, um, other reasons why people have embraced the the primacy of consciousness or the, you know, belief in non a non-objective world. Sometimes it's to protect some, some beliefs that they can't give up. Uh, probably the most common one is a belief in God or you know, supernatural, which every culture has been drawn to in one form or another, I think, historically. <coughs> and if you have that, then there's a bias to make your view of the world we we do live in consistent with those beliefs. Sure, exactly. So if you're committed to the immortality of the soul, and then the soul has to be consciousness apart from any physical body, right. any physical right. connection, and then there must be a higher reality or connection where there's nothing but disembodied consciousness. Now disembodied consciousness is primary the whole world is shaped for disembodied consciousness's purposes. Mm -hmm. And really, when you get right down to it, there's nothing but disembodied consciousness. And you wanted that all along because what you wanted was the immortality of the soul. Right. And I'm just taking another step down that path. Um, 
uh, one of the standard conceptions of uh, within um, Christianity of God's creation of the world is that he created it by thinking it. Yeah. Uh, in fact, in the Chronicles of Narnia, isn't there, doesn't the God character at some point sing the world or something like that? I can't remember. Um, which is a, a beautiful artistic rending, rendering of, of the Christian idea of it. Um, of course, that's, if, if, if you believe anything like that, your view of consciousness can't be the objectivist one that, you know, we were talking about in, in the lecture. Right, so. because it's axiomatic. That it's existence axiomatic. exists, <laughs> and it is what it is. It has identity, and that consciousness is awareness. Well said. We should print that.